Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, we're going to preview three players on the fringe of the Timberwolves rotation. Josh Minot does even have a chance to break the rotation. Terrence Shannon Jr. as a rookie, what could his role be this year? And also, speaking of new roles, Luca Garza's in a new role on the Wolves. We'll break down all these players' seasons upcoming next. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by FanDuel. You can start the season with a big return on FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet. You'll get started with 200 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. And also happy Timberwolves preseason game day number two. The Wolves take on the Philadelphia 76ers tonight. I don't I, like I don't think I'm previewing this really because I don't really know what to say about it. Apparently, Paul George is going to play, but the game's also not being televised. Apparently, it's one of those where on League Pass, you can get an in-season arena feed or excuse me, an in-arena feed. Uh, but it doesn't look like it's on YouTube TV on League Pass. Bally is not broadcasting. Philly's uh, uh, broadcast partner is not broadcasting. So good luck looking for it out there. Uh, but it is not on a, a regular broadcast feed. So, uh, But we're also not doing a straight up post game pod. I'll talk a little bit about what happened Friday on Monday's show, but the Wolves also play Sunday, so we'll talk more about that Monday. Anyway, today, I want to focus on previewing the edge of the rotation, the fringe of the rotation for the Wolves. We'll get into that in a moment. A big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also follow on X. That's uh, at B Beacon and also at Locked on T Wolves. Don't forget the T. And also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. All right. Let's go ahead and dive in here. I want to I, I wanna talk about some of the more interesting players on the edges or the fringe, if you will, of the Timberwolves rotation. And I want to start with the rookie, the, the headliner of this group, because he's new, because he's a lottery talent that the Wolves got in the 20s of this draft. And that's Terrence Shannon Jr., um, who is going to go by TJ. Um, so... What does he bring to the table? What could his role be on this Timberwolves team? Previewing him as a draft prospect before before the draft, I had him a little bit lower in my big board. There were some other guys that remained on the board at that time I wanted instead of TSJ. And, and the primary reason was I was worried about how much of his scoring was simply volume related, simply uh, due to you know not being another not being on a team with other perimeter oriented scorers at the college level. Remember, he played at Texas Tech, transferred to Illinois, was a on track to be a finalist for the Naismith Award as the best college player last year, had uh, some legal issues that kept him off the court from like December to February. He played in March Madness, played well, especially given how much time he had been off uh, away from the court, I should say. And then, you know, the found not guilty and, and, and now he's actually countersuing. We covered that a couple of weeks ago. So the off the court stuff will not completely over um, setting that aside, which is the primary reason why he dropped from the lottery to the 20s. I was just a little bit concerned about the volume scoring stuff and how his athleticism would play at the NBA level. He's obviously athletic, but like it's not going to be as easy to get to your spots, of course. Um, on the flip side, though, he's fantastic in transition. He's a solid defender, and he's got a really good NBA body. Like in terms of uh, of of getting to your spots in the NBA, I thought it was possible because the athleticism is po- is um you know above average. He's a good athlete. He's also got a pretty big body for a wing. It was some of the other stuff, right? The, the other skills, whether it's the ball handling, uh, shot creation in general. I think he's got good touch, but I just didn't know what the what the true upside was there. Well, the more I thought about it after the Wolves got him, I, I actually think if they're going to ask him to be in a role similar to like what they tried to have Troy Brown Jr. do last year. And, and frankly, I actually, I, I think that's a lot of what that type of quote unquote role is what Terrence Shannon Jr. is going to be in this year, which is some nights you're not going to play. Other nights you are. You're going to be an energy guy off the bench that's going to have to defend. You're going to have to be a tear in transition. You're going to have to knock down open catch and shoot threes. That's kind of it. We need you to be a big body defender on the wing. Some nights you're the 11th guy you're not playing. You're the 10th guy. We might only play nine. Some nights we're going to need you for 12 minutes. If we've got a couple injuries, we're playing a back-to-back. There's a chance you start. 
there's a chance more likely you're you're you know the seventh guy. Maybe Nikhil starts and, and you're you know one of the backup wings. I think his size, his NBA body, again, absorbing contact offensively, absorbing contact defensively. And I I keep using the word terror to describe him in transition. That is absolutely apt. He is really good, can is fast with the ball in his hands, can dunk on guys. We saw that in summer league. Uh I think we saw it in the Lakers game too, the preseason game. It can it wants to just just posterize dudes. Like he wants to do that and he can do it. He's also a good three-point shooter with distance. He's more of a volume three-point shooter. He was, you know, not not really above average percentage-wise, but the volume was there and the distance, the ability for him to shoot from 29 feet is absolutely there. Catch and shoot in transition that can be valuable you know, late clock situations, if you need it, whatever uh, he's not going to create in the half court. He's not, but like, they're not going to ask him to, they're not going to ask him to initiate offense. He, they're not going to ask him to be a consistent source of 14 points off the bench. He's going to be instant offense, energy, solid defense, kind of the, the fourth guy up, fifth guy up when it comes to rim or excuse me, wing protector. Nope. <laughs> wing defenders, potentially point of attack defenders. That's what he's going to be asked to do. And I absolutely think he can do it. He's a solid defender, and, and I go back to consistency here. He was actually a little bit of a better defender at Texas Tech, I thought, than at Illinois uh, in, in what I watched of him. Um, and I don't know if it's because he was carrying such a load offensively. I talked a little bit with Sonny uh, Verma of Lockdown Illini in the wake of the, the draft. So this would have been in probably late June, early July. And Sonny's opinion was, go back and, and find that, listen to it if you haven't. Sonny's opinion was he was just being so heavily relied upon offensively that there just wasn't as much juice for him to be consistently solid night in and night out possession in possession out on defense. But the high level was still there. Like the, the, the peak was still there defensively. It just, it wasn't consistent. And that was one of the knocks that scouts had on him in the draft was, can he defend consistently? And Sonny would argue from lockdown and Illini, and, and this makes sense to me. It wasn't a matter of like want to, or can he actually do it? It was, he was just tired. Like they, they were burning him out. They were so reliant, putting so much of the offense on his shoulders, a really good Illinois team that the focus, or at least the, the, um, uh, I don't know the, the, what's the right word. Um, focus maybe isn't even the right word, but I guess attention being paid to defense and the, the ability to be a top flight defender night in and night out every single possession. is just a lot tougher when there's that much. We saw that with Ant. It's actually not too dissimilar to Ant at the NBA level. Now, Ant in college, I think he just got bored and didn't have good teammates. Ant at the NBA level, when he has an off night defensively, when he has a lapse off the ball, when he just looks tired, it's because he is tired because he's carrying so much of a load offensively. I think we saw that from TJ Shannon in college a little bit. The, the tools are there, the athleticism, the size, the length. Uh, I think the basketball IQ overall, it seems decent enough. Uh, again, he's not going to be initiating offense. Like He's just got to understand timing, spacing, where to be defensively off the ball could be a question. What's that going to look like? But I think as like an 11th guy, there's real upside there as like a future six man type or, or starting, you know, three and D type guy. But right now it's inject that energy into the game, play the play, the TBJ, the Troy Brown junior role from last year, but even better knocked out open threes. Uh, it's an element that this team, they wanted it last year. They had to, jettison it when they traded Troy Brown Jr. And I think he's actually going to be directly competing with Josh Minot for some of these minutes. And, and I know they play slightly different positions, but the role, what they're trying to get out of this 10th, 11th man in the rotation is very similar. And so we'll talk about that relative to Josh Minot and, and why they're similar, but different uh, and, what, and what they can give Chris Finch this year. So we'll talk about uh, transition and talking about Josh Minot here next, and we'll close with some Luca Garza conversation. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at Game Time. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. They've got tons of live events available on Game Time. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. You can pick any upcoming live event on the app, browse through the seats on Game Time Picks, and uh, you know find what works best for you. And speaking of those live events, Obviously, sporting events, but you can also find concerts. I'm a big concert fan. My wife and I go to comedy shows. We'll go to theater. She loves theater. She loves Broadway. You can find all that stuff on Game Time. And Game Time Picks, the curation makes it easier to save. You can also toggle on the all-in pricing feature, which will allow you to see the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. Again, just toggle on all-in pricing 
And uh, you can see your total with no surprise fees at checkout. Get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. And also, the game time ticket coverage means that your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code Lockdown NBA. That's L O C K E D O N N B A for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? Game time. All right. So we've established that Terrence Shannon Jr. is going to be likely on the outside looking in, but also there's some nights he may get some run early on in his rookie season. Let's talk about Josh Minot. Josh Minot, of course, second round pick a couple of years ago, played just one year at Memphis. And this the book on him was raw, you know, a great athlete, great size, but just raw from a basketball skill perspective. He didn't play that much at Memphis. Like he came off the bench, didn't play that many minutes, but the upside was clearly there. Um, I did a, a whole show on him last summer about like what he could bring to the table activity wise. And that to me is still the biggest thing. And, and we'll talk in, in a minute here about how the shooting looks better. And Chris Finch has been raving about him and Tim Connolly's talked about him. Um, but everything about him as a prospect, which is still relevant because he hasn't played that much professionally still, even though he's been on the roster, he's played some of the G league. I just think what he brought in college is still relevant as a prospect. Uh, oh, by the way, I've said this before, but a lot of people thought he was still a lottery pick, even though he was so raw, like John Hollinger's one and John Hollinger's obviously an analytics guy. That's, that's his focus. But when he was doing draft boards a couple of years ago, he had Minot as a, as a lottery pick because the upside was there. And because a lot of the, the, the kind of peripheral stats were so impressive. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit here in college. And it was a little over 30 games. I think it was like 33 games. He had a rebound rate of 15, excuse me, 14.4%, which would be top 35 in the NBA. He had a defensive rebound rate of 15.7% and a 12.9% offensive rebound rate. 15.7% is, is solid. It's not outstanding, but remember he's a skinny pogo stick that played, you know, wasn't playing center, right? He played the three and the four. Uh, offensive rate rebound rate of about 13% would have would have been a top 10 NBA offensive rebound rate in most seasons. His block rate was 5.4%, also would be a top 10 block rate in the NBA. So, like if we look at like I'm gonna pull this up real quick. I'm gonna pull up last year's uh NBA season and we can look at the leaders in block rate, like this is gonna be right there. It absolutely will be. Um, and again, this is not a dude that was playing in the paint and protecting uh protecting the rim. Like that wasn't his primary role. He's a perimeter defender and a help side defender. Uh, okay. So league wide block rate, what did I say? He was 5.4. Yeah. 5.4% block rate. Okay. The only guys that would have had a higher block rate last season than Josh Minot in college, miles Turner, Rudy Gobert, Anthony Davis, Chris Stapps, Porzingis, Nick Claxton had a fantastic defensive year, Brooke Lopez, Daniel Gafford, Chet Holmgren and Wemby. So he would have been number 10 in the NBA in block rate last year if he if you copy and paste what he did in college. I know he's not going to do that in the NBA and limited data we have like he hasn't. Um, but the point is, as a help side defender, despite being raw with the ball in his hands and certainly raw offensively overall, the jumper has taken forever to come around and you know the jury's still out whether it really has or not. This dude can block shots. And by the way, when I said it hasn't, the block rate hasn't been there in the NBA in just 47 games under 200 minutes, he does have a 5.2% block rate at the NBA level. So he's still blocking shots like it's 2022 and he's playing at Memphis. Like that's still what we're seeing from Josh Mina. I'm going to pull up his, his G League block rates too, because I, like, I mean, he's going to play probably small ball four, maybe play some three. That's going to be what he does. Let's see. Uh, okay. Showcase Cup the last two years in the G League because for whatever reason, basketball reference splits it up. 5.7% block rate. Regular season, 4.2%. So we're going to do some fuzzy math here and call it 5%. So he's around 5% block rate at the NBA level was 5.4% in college. The dude's going to hunt you down and block your shot no matter what. He doesn't have to play the five to do that. That is what's most attractive, not specifically the block shots, but you factor in the steal rate, which uh, in college would have been the best steal rate in the league. Like, again, I'm not so naive to think that he's going to have a, a 3% steal rate at the NBA level. 
but like last year in the G League, it was it was over four percent in limited play. Um, overall in the G League over the two years, he's about uh, eh, a little under two percent. So it hasn't quite been there. But the steal rate, block rate together, we always talk about stocks, activity level, guys that that have the do stuff ability, as I like to call it. And Troy Brown Jr. is is one of those, which is one of the reasons why I think between him and Terrence Shannon Jr., those are two guys that could split that role, that kind of tenth man role, uh, maybe ninth man role, depending on the night. And provide that to the Timberwolves. I, I like having a nose for the ball, being in passing lanes, getting 50, 50 balls. Uh, that's all positive. And if he could really shoot now, which there's no, no real professional evidence, no evidence in pro or college to suggest that he could shoot, but apparently his shot looks a lot better. It's, it's the whole like best shape of his life talk, you know, around training camp time. I get it, but Limited data sure looked good in that Lakers game last week. Uh, the coaching staff sure talked about it a lot. Now, I'm also old enough to remember when, you know, Chris Finch was talking up Jalen Noel as a potential six man of the year, like three years ago. That didn't play out. Actually, two years ago. Yikes. Uh, you know, and, and the Jaden McDaniels hyperbole with, with Scotty Pippen. And like, you know, I get it. It's it's talk. It's lip service. But so far, the limited, extremely limited one game sample size we have is he looked great. So we're going to keep watching this over preseason. And if that jumper is like league averagey or a little bit better between him and Terrence Shannon Jr., you've got a couple of real nice options to round out the rotation. I, like comparing the two, Minot's going to give you more rebounding. He's also going to be more comfortable playing the four. He's got a bit more proven defensive activity, certainly at the professional level than, than Terrence Shannon Jr. does. It Sitting here right now, we have to say TSJ has got the offensive advantage, whereas Minot, you know, better on the glass of both ends of the floor. It gives you that same energy, just in a bigger body with, with uh, we'll call it less polish with the ball in his hands. Both good options. It's super exciting to see, and they're both high upside guys. Like, Terrence Shannon's actually older because he was a, I believe it was a five-year offensive, or five, excuse me, five-year college player, if I'm not mistaken, um, between Tech and, Texas Tech and, um, and uh, Illinois. So he's actually, let's see, he just turned 24 summer. Josh Minot, I think, is only 22. Not even 22. He turns 22 November 25th. So Minot's actually like three years-ish younger than Terrence Shannon, but he's been a pro for two years. So they both have upside, no matter how you slice it. And they both give you energy. They both give you perimeter defense. They both, hopefully, can shoot the three. The advantage for Terrence Shannon Jr. is he's going to be a little bit more switchable at the point of attack than Josh Minot because he's, he should be a little quicker laterally. Uh, he's going to be able to handle the ball a little bit in transition, even if he's not initiated, he could push the pace. You don't necessarily want my not doing that with the ball in his hands too often. And uh, he's going to be a better catch and shoot guy, or at least he should be with more range. Certainly Josh Monet's advantage is he's bigger. He's going to block shots. He's going to rebound. We've seen him do it on some level in limited NBA action and limited G league action as a pro. He's also three years younger. There's positives to both of these guys and everybody that's in front of them in the rotation, the five starters plus Nasri and Alexander Walker, uh, uh, Dante DiVincenzo and um, Joe Ingles. Th those have to be the nine guys, right, that are ahead of him and TSJ. Number 10 is Josh Minor to Terrence Shannon Jr. Or maybe Kate Bates Diop, who we talked about on yesterday's show. I think that's it. Like, that, that's, that's your rotation. These guys are going to be battling it out for fringe rotation minutes, depending on the night, depending on the matchups, and uh, depending on how they afford themselves when they get the opportunity to play this year. It's going to be a ton of fun to watch. I love Josh Minot. Uh, if you've listened to the show for the last couple of years, any chance I get, which isn't that often because he doesn't play that much, I think he's got high upside as a, as like a, I keep comparing him. This is now an older comparison, but out of the draft, I thought he was like a little bit like a Brandon Clark type player. Energy, offensive rebounding, a little bit of scoring, um, but like that, that do stuff guy. And they need that. They need that. Um, especially, you know, like as Mike Conley continues to get older and, and, you know, Kyle Anderson was a bit of a do stuff guy for them. Like there were some things that weren't great about him, certainly offensively, the turnovers, et cetera. Uh, and Minot is, is absolutely way more athletic, but you need somebody who can do all of the little things, get the stocks defensively. And both Minot and Shannon are going to have the ability to do that for the Wolves this year. I'm very excited to see how it plays out. And both those guys, I think could, could mean a lot to this team throughout the regular season. All right, let's close by checking in on our old friend, Luca Garza, who is in a different role this year. He's, he's, contract's different and i think the expectations for him are now different and he may actually see some playing time here and there so we'll talk about him here next
Today's episode of Locked Out Wolves is brought to us by our title sponsors at FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start your season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. I'm going to dig into some of the NFL matchups this Sunday. There's a game in London again this week, which is always fun because you just get football all day long. Um, of course, the Wolves play Sunday evening as well. That'll be on there from a preseason NBA perspective, which is a bit dicey, but it is the Carl Anthony Towns Knicks game on Sunday. Uh, so check that on, on FanDuel. I miss live betting Thursday night, but like there's a full slate on Sunday. Uh, so go check it out on FanDuel. You can get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Again, just place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Check out the Sunday slate for football. Check out NBA preseason. Check out the NBA win totals. I said this the other day. The Wolves actually, their win total of 52 and a half on FanDuel did not move after the cat trade. So go check that out. Again, place a $5 bet. You get 200 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed if it's your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel at FanDuel.com. All right. Let's close by talking Luca Garza. Garza has been on the team now for two years. He signed a pair of two-way contracts with the Wolves before the 22-23 season and then before last season. Last April, because the Wolves needed to satisfy a roster minimum and you know they had brought in Justin Jackson at one point, they brought in um, TJ Warren, and then at the end of the season, they had to fill their roster. So they converted Luca Garza to a two, from a two-way to a regular contract. The other thing is to make him available for the playoffs, to allow him to play in the playoffs. And so they did that. Last year, Garza barely played in the G League. He almost exclusively was on the bench for the Wolves in the regular season. He played... Uh, uh, Actually, no regular season games for the Owl Wolves last season. He played in three Showcase Cup games. Remember, two years ago, he was like the MVP or whatever of the G League, and he barely played that season. Last year, in just three games with the Owl Wolves, he averaged 37 points per game, 36.7, 12, over 12 rebounds a game, a blo- 1.7 blocks per game, and he shot 57% from the floor. He was only 33% from three. Uh, but for his G League career, Garza has been like a league average, like 37 ish, three point percent, three point shooter over parts of three seasons in the G league with motor city back in 21, 22. And then also last the last two years with Iowa. So he is now a full-time NBA player. He's on a guaranteed contract, a standard contract. And he is, you know, I, I just talked about like the top nine plus two top nine plus Terrence Shannon jr. And Josh mine, that gets you to 11 Luca Garza probably is the 12th guy, but the difference here is he's next up when it comes to bigs. You get past Rudy Gobert, Julius Randle, Nas Reed. That's it. Now you're talking, do you want Josh Minot at the four? I mean, Garza's ahead of Leonard Miller. He's ahead of two-way guy, Jesse Edwards. You're down to Garza. So he's like, he's on the roster and he's got a real shot at playing. Like say Rudy picks up two quick fouls and, you know, Nas is sick. Well, now it's Luca Garza. Or even if Nas isn't sick, you may still see some Luka Garza depending on the matchup. The Wolves were hesitant to expose him in certain matchups last year, but I think depending on what the matchup is, they've seen enough from Luka that they keep giving him contracts. They keep now guaranteeing him money. We know what he could do offensively. He could be an effective offensive player. The trick with Luka Garza, he's a different type of offensive bit or a different type of big period, but offensive minded, right? Like he's not from the Rudy Gobert, Jesse Edwards archetype who are rim protectors that are roll bigs. They're going to dive to the rim every time. There's no range on their shot. You're not going to post them up. Uh, They're there to block shots and get dunks off of lobs and clean up offensive boards. That's what Rudy Gobert and Jesse Edwards, again, Jesse Edwards, the the two-way center for the two-way player who's a center for the Wolves this year, rookie undrafted out of West Virginia. He's also not of the Nas Reed archetype, the cat, you know, Nas Reed, cat, Leonard Miller archetype. And I would actually add Josh Minot. You know, Minot's not a center. Uh, Luca Garza is. So they don't they don't play the same position. But in today's NBA, like Minot could play some four and Garza could be out there with another center. Um, so I'd lump Minot in there too. He doesn't fit in the Nas, Cat, Miller, or the Minot category, which is a stretch big that also has ball skills. Like Nas can operate on the perimeter. You can post him up. Leonard Miller can operate on the perimeter. He can be a point forward. Obviously the same would all be said of Cat. Minot's not a traditional big. Like Garza is actually more similar to Julius Randle. Like if we're going to put these guys all in different buckets and their games aren't that similar, but like Randle's very comfortable operating in the mid post. He's comfortable facing up. Uh, he's comfortable screening and rolling. He's more of a, a bully with the ball in his hands. Uh, is a good, but not great three point shooter. 
all those things are true with Luca Garza. Now he's more comfortable posting up and he's going to do a little more damage on the offensive glass than Randall. He's bigger than Randall. Uh, he's also not as quick laterally. So defensively, there's no question. Randall's better than Luca Garza. That's the primary reason Garza is not a true rotation caliber player for a contender. I mean, he could go start for the, you know, Portland or somebody and, and put up probably 18 points a game relatively efficiently, but defensively is the issue with Luca. And he's to his credit, he's improved dramatically there from when he came into the league He's gotten himself into better shape. He's become quicker laterally. He understands how to play. Uh, he understands spacing and, and and pick and roll coverages and all that stuff. He's just, he's not quite quick enough laterally or at this point, big enough in terms of uh, his strength and his, his body mass, like in the post to slow down like bully ball type guys. Like he's not going to be able to stop Nikola Jokic. He can make his life difficult, but he's probably going to foul him. Right. He's also not quick enough laterally to like, you don't want him switching onto a guard on the perimeter. You just don't. But he's got himself in a place where he could be passable defensively. And he already, we know he's a good offensive player. Uh, if he was a knockdown three point shooter, then we could have the conversation about is he good enough offensively that he can overcome some of those defensive warts? Right now, he's still a depth piece. But if he's your 11th guy or your 12th guy or your fourth big, you're in pretty good shape. Like the dude can score. We've seen this in garbage time. We've seen it in a couple of games where he had to play some rotation minutes. There was a game against Denver last year that they almost won. But I think both Cat and Rudy missed. Luca Garza can do all of that stuff. He can give you professional minutes. He can be a solid depth piece. And, and that's his role this year. Last year, it was a last resort. The last two years, he was a last resort. He just was. And obviously, they like his work ethic. They like how hard you know, he's worked to get to where he is to get the guaranteed money after being a second round pick cut after a season by the miserable Detroit Pistons. Like they love his work ethic and they love what he brings to the facility. There's no question about that. But now he's got a real role. Like if Rudy sprains an ankle and misses a week, you're up, man, you're going to play. You're going to play him over Jesse Edwards. So that's, that's, that's the, the deal with Luca Garza this year. Nothing's changed in terms of what he provides other than he continues to just be a pro and getting like, I think he's probably the same shape he was a year ago, which is good shape. Um, it, but all the things that we've seen him do, he can do, he can continue to do. And now he's doing it as like the 12th man, as the fourth big, as the break glass in case of emergency, but even a little bit elevated beyond that. Like, I don't think they're afraid to use Luca Garza. And they showed that last year at times, uh, you know, as the year wore on and they had some injuries and cat was out and stuff like that. So, Good for Luca, also, by the way, to be on the guaranteed deal. And if he's our 12th, if, if, he, if he, you're the Timberwolves, he's your 12th guy, you feel good. You really do. All right. Wolves, Sixers tonight, Friday night, uh, not broadly televised. So good luck finding it. Uh, probably tweet a little bit about it. Uh, on, on Sunday, though, the Wolves do take on the New York Knicks. I think it's a 5 p.m. game, and it's on ESPN. So Wolves in the Garden to take on Carl Anthony Towns. I should note, Friday's game is in Des Moines, where the Iowa Wolves play. So that's part of the reason why it's not on TV. But the Wolves play on Sunday at the Knicks, 5 o'clock Central, Madison Square Garden, ESPN. Of course, we'll talk all about it. We'll have a Monday morning show. That will be the Monday game, uh, Monday podcast. It's the post-game pod. We'll talk all about Wolves-Knicks on Sunday. So looking forward to that. It'll be a lot of fun uh, to, to, to see a couple different Wolves games this weekend, but also, also to see Cat take on the Wolves on Sunday. That's all we got for you today. Big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.